previous experience next to zero yet. He has a recommend letter from our board. WTF to them. Unlike Filmento, I'm just going to go straight to the point. I'm concerned about the bad advice and coverage Filmento gave to this specific movie. I'm a Transformers fan, but even I understand the flaws of this film. The original Bay Trilogy sits alongside the Star Wars prequels, for me, as flawed but beloved parts of my childhood. This video is different, as it outright suggests awful strategies for filmmaking and inaccuracies of the film, which suggests that he didn't even bother checking the wiki on the plot. Speaking of inaccuracies... Do I know somebody on your board? Michael Bay's... Filmento uses an interview of Ridley Scott, best known for sci-fi horror movie Alien, talking about Michael Bay to set up his first point, specifically about how Scott says Bay's films are digital masterpieces. Filmento severely cuts down the context led up to this statement, which is explanatory as it counters Filmento's points. Do you think sometimes then that, maybe particularly in the sci-fi, area that the CGI, the effects and stuff has got over the top? Yeah, the, 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 the cart is before the horse. The horse is the story, but suddenly the horse is secondary to the cart. So you're watching certain things occur. That said, you know, Michael Bay's... When Ridley Scott is thinking about stories suffering from being sidelined by special effects, he thinks of Michael Bay making sure to cover the indirect insult by respecting the output as digital masterpieces, as Bay is considered to Scott as a hard worker. Scott then commends Bay in his ability to work on such large-scale movies with tight deadlines, as such a task is not for everyone, including Ridley Scott as he admits. I mean this, digital masterpieces, I mean, I mean, uh, is the, the big... Uh digital film with, uh, what do you call them? Oh, Transformers. Transformers. They are, that's hard to do. And so people may laugh or love it. I admire it because I haven't got the patience to do that. Or, But he's got that kind of brain that makes it work and it's inordinately successful. So that's the only film I can think of where digital process is worthwhile. The key thing to note is that Ridley Scott praises Michael Bay's work ethic as Scott finds it too difficult to replicate those movies in terms of scale and vision. No doubt Ridley Scott finds Michael Bay as a hard-working director, despite indirectly recognizing the poor quality of the lighting. Filmento doesn't shy away from talking shit about Michael Bay, so it's strange how he doesn't jump on this. 2011's Transformers Dark of the Moon at first glance will seem like a movie that suffers from the exact same problems as the ones that preceded and followed it. It's a loud, mindless, overlong hodgepodge of visual and audible noise that was made by a director who appears to care only about one thing, his own signature style of triple B filmmaking. Remember, Filmento's point about the three Bs that he states Michael Bay only thinks about awfully. Keep that in mind. But that being said, take a closer look and you might find that Dark of the Moon is also perhaps the best exemplification of the strengths of director Michael Bay, which basically comes down to the words epic and blockbuster. See, what this movie highlights better than any other is Michael Bay's success. It's the highest grossing film in the franchise and the fact that it made over a billion dollars back in 2011 is insane. A financial success doesn't mean a great movie. Remember, Ridley Scott stating that some movies are sacrificing story for the spectacle. Michael Bay's Transformers franchise is exactly what he's talking about. It's not as extreme as Avatar being completely forgotten, but it's safe to say the franchise suffers the same illness. Filmento stated that the franchise peaked at Dark of the Moon, meaning it didn't continue to rise with the next three movies, which is a good indication that the landscape has changed to the detriment of the box office of the next installments. It would be important to assess why that is in order to be sure the qualities that made Dark of the Moon successful can be safely replicated and thus be given as good advice to filmmakers and their projects. But Filmento doesn't do that. And it's all because, no matter how much flack you and I give Michael Bay and his movies here in line, the fact is that we live in a bubble. We represent just a tiny piece of that billion dollars. I guess Filmento doesn't know about pirating movies. Also, this is a simplistic view of the concept of demographics. In actuality, there are many different demographics, and they tend to overlap with each other. 
Demographics are a way for companies to measure the interests of groups in an effort to better target and appeal to audiences. Companies do extensive research in order to better understand the fans or the demographics of their product and take further steps to keep them coming back for more. It's not as simplistic as people who watch reviews and people who just listen to an ad and then go watch a movie. The general majority of audiences, they don't watch videos about movies online. They don't read about movies on Twitter or on Rotten Tomatoes. They just see an ad on TV or a big billboard on the street or hear about the movie from a friend at work and then go see it based on that. Over the years, it seems that audiences are more willing to look into reviews in order to avoid putting down $20 on a movie that will only disappoint. And the live action movies decline is proof of that. I've worked in a movie theater and many times I've seen people walk away silently with their faces shrouded in disappointment from what I can very much say is a bad movie. These are the silent majority. The silent majority will tend not to show up and you're left dumbfounded why. Which is why I always appreciate criticism. Recent years have shown that the larger more casual moviegoers are more aware and cautious about the quality of new movies. This franchise's decline to the point they have to soft reboot their movie franchise is proof of that. And not questioning any positive from Phil Mentor on Dark of the Moon's success is an ignorant course of action since it's obvious it couldn't keep the franchise afloat. And for people like this, Dark of the Moon does offer a truly epic blockbuster experience that no other selection at the theater can match. Except for all the other movies in the franchise. Only offering big explosions and huge set pieces is a temporary advantage as the competition will rise to your level of output. This tactic should only be used to get people into seats and not keep them. It's the same as heavy marketing on video game. It's all useless when word gets around, it's utter shit. We don't get any more installments to Michael Bay's Transformers universe, or the Bayverse as fans coined it, due to this exact fact, as Marvel, DC, and Godzilla's Monsterverse now offer the same level of big explosions and set pieces. To no surprise at all, the most popular and successful franchises end up having the better writing. And even though you can argue that, well, that's just because it's a bunch of big CGI robots fighting, no it's not. Others have tried the exact same thing with nowhere near the same success. Pacific Rim was a brand new franchise, while Transformers Dark of the Moon was not only the third movie in the live action series, but also a part of a 27 year old franchise. Pacific Rim was going up against heavy competition, such as Monsters University, Wolverine, and Despicable Me 2 all coming out a week before. They aren't monster fighting movies, but they grabbed a big pool of people that are pretty hesitant to try a brand new franchise. Pacific Rim also had a budget of 190 million, making it a success as not only a new franchise competing with big players, but also one that could potentially reach greater heights. Remember, just because a movie didn't make all the money doesn't mean it's bad. Despite all the money Avatar made, the world seems to completely forget about it, which contradicts Filmental's focus on money as an indication that others should copy Michael Bay's example. No, as much as we like to ignore here online, there are some inherent factors about Michael Bay as a filmmaker that allow him to create this sense of blockbuster epicness that appeals to mass audiences. Factors that can be outdated and not work anymore. The live action movies declined to the point they had to do a soft reboot with Bumblebee's solo movie, meaning any of the factors that led to Dark of the Moon's success should be called into question. Fermento doesn't consider this and sells bad advice as a result. Because I mean, if Steven Spielberg respects his work, if James Cameron respects his work, if freaking Chris Nolan respects his work to the point of apparently loving it, there has to be something there. Steven Spielberg has directly worked with Michael Bay as producer on all five Transformers movies that were directed by Bay himself. Why would Spielberg say ill will of Michael Bay and of the movies they worked together on? He directly benefits from continued financial success of these movies. Do your freaking research, Fermento. Moreover, do you honestly believe that Nolan and Cameron will badmouth a fellow director in their own industry? You don't talk smack about a co-worker. Instead, they respond with a professional, I respect him, response. Remember how Mark Hamill publicly stated how he disliked Johnson's direction with Luke Skywalker for The Last Jedi? 
Despite all that disagreement, Hamill said he still respects Ryan Johnson. Also, Christopher Nolan can love a movie despite it being awful. Like me with Bay's first Transformers movie. Final point, Phil Mantel already stated the key things that Bay offers, so why is he asking for them now? It's not about saying this movie is better than any I've talked negatively about before. It's just about taking lessons from Michael Bay's work that for once are positive in nature. He's talking about marketing strategies. And at no point does he note the good qualities of the writing in this movie as a positive aspect that can bring people into the movie. These strategies aren't inherently positive either. Using Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson in marketing to help sell an indie movie like The Lighthouse is good, while using Mark Hamill to sell The Force Awakens despite him being regulated to a teaser cameo for the next movie isn't. There's a difference in execution that will either anger or please moviegoers. Don't ever think a marketing strategy is always positive as it's entirely based on a case-by-case -case basis. The first way Michael Bay makes this movie feel massive and epic is by building it on top of real-life events and situations that the audience carries pre-existing feelings and respect for. If Twitter has told me anything, not everyone respects even the worst of atrocities. Also, the inclusion of real-world events doesn't automatically make it more epic, as the inclusion of major events in this movie help indicate to the audience when events occur and to better explain how this invasion plot was able to remain concealed from major countries. Splicing your plot with real history doesn't automatically make it epic. Filmento. As an example, take the main plot of the movie that, at face value, is very vanilla. Basically, the evil Decepticons want to use these CGI portals to bring their own CGI planet to Earth, which naturally then leads to all kinds of bayas and bayhem and, of course, a blue sky beam. How does this dude get around copyright? Jesus! Also, he's not wrong about the laser in the sky. And I don't think anyone is proud of that, honestly. But the reason the plot ultimately feels much bigger and more significant than what it is at face value is because when the movie opens, it immediately begins building it upon something that every single one of us has knowledge of. The Cold War Space Race. We now have had confirmation of loss of signal from the Apollo 11. Neil, you are dark on the rock. Mission is a go. Minutes. Right, so it turns out that the actual classified reason the Cold War space race took place is because an alien ship crash landed on the moon and the US had to get there before the Soviets, which in the moment already creates this very effective sense of mystery and urgency. Tying in the space race not only gives the audience the relation of events in terms of when they happen, but also to address concerns in the plot. The human race were aware of the Ark crashing into the moon, so they investigated it, using the space race as a cover. Otherwise, plot concerns would ask why humanity didn't notice the Ark, and the movie spends time away from the explosions to explain further why we didn't learn about it before in the previous movies, since according to this movie, it was buried on purpose to protect the invasion plot. The build of Filmento mentions is entirely based on the film's execution, rather than if you spliced your plot with a historical event. Tying to a major event doesn't always make it more special, and ignoring the alternative benefits such a method adds is short-sighted. Why are you so simplistic, Filmento? You shouldn't be if you are teaching others about film. We're getting secret meetings with the president. We're getting to witness an event the entire world was lied to about. We're getting to watch something that honestly doesn't even feel like a Transformers movie, but instead more an extension to this real life event that all of us all around the world do perceive as a significant moment in human history. I guess I'm gonna go hardcore fanboy about this, but the concept of human history being affected by influence of the war between Autobots and Decepticons is nothing new. Hell, the first movie outright confirms that studying Megatron and the Allspark helped humanity advance in technology. You failing to notice that doesn't make the plot of Dark of the Moon suddenly more special or unique. Research more about your topic, Filmento. 
And it's this pre-existing mental value that the movie infuses into the plot. The plot of the Decepticons manipulating the real-life space program and its key personnel in order to fulfill their goal of invading the Earth. Turns out that the reason the space program stagnated after the 60s is because the Decepticons didn't want humans to find what's hidden there. They came to my dad and they told him to do some creative accounting. They get way too expensive to ever go back. Turns out that key NASA and ex-Soviet space employees are suddenly dying left and right because we're in the endgame now. Wow, what a creative way of tying real history and the plot. I would reasonably say this is a good writing worth seeing the movie for, and a strategy I would recommend other filmmakers to aspire to do for their projects. It involves a careful understanding of history and the effort to tie it together, thus showing your skill as a writer as well. Filmento just glosses over this positive aspect of the film and instead doubles down on explosions. Turns out that everything that has happened from the 60s to present day is because... Before Apollo 11 ever got there. The Decepticons have the ship, they have all those pillars. Why would they leave Sentinel when he's the only one that could use them? He's the one thing they still need. And even though Michael Bay's goofy tone admittedly doesn't always help, the basic crux of it is this. We all know the moon landing is a massive historic event. And so if the moon landing is actually just a tiny piece of this film's giant plot puzzle, then whatever that plot puzzle is has to be pretty damn massive as well. The act of infusing real life events doesn't automatically make the movie more significant. Take the movie 1917. The significance of that movie is the protagonist's mission and how the success or failure of it has consequences on his world, which is built off the filmmaker's skill and not on it slowly being set in World War I. Dark of the Moon builds its significance by building the importance of the arc and using the major events of the space race to explain how the timeline of both species overlap. The rest of the movie explains the real purpose of the arc and how an alien race hid its true purpose with cover-ups and deals with humans. They actually tried writing a coherent plot that builds up to the eventual alien invasion, and is the reason why this movie succeeds where the previous installment fails, specifically Revenge of the Fallen. The last movie sold on Egyptian landmarks like how Dark of the Moon sold on a moon landing conspiracy, but Revenge of the Fallen only ended up having its tie-in as a backdrop for fight scenes. Can we please stop relying on set pieces, major historical events, and instead focus on the lighting? That's how the Michael Bay Transformers movies died in the first place. It gets old. To explain this further on a more contained scene location level, look at the sequence early on where we go to this facility to search for this alien energy spike. Very quickly, you'll notice that it isn't just any random facility, but instead a very specific one. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. Yeah, so once we realize that this facility is Chernobyl, the significance of the sequence immediately jumps multiple levels above of what it was with a random facility. Because again, we've all heard about Chernobyl and the messed up stuff that happened there. We all carry some level of built-in mental appreciation toward it that now infuses with the sequence. If what we're searching for is in Chernobyl, then whatever that thing is, it's gotta be a big f***ing deal. These are surface level hooks meaning they are nothing but a shallow reference to something popular. The fact it's in Chernobyl means nothing to the plot other than a vague connection to Russia's involvement in the space race. In the short term, it gets people in the seats, but word spreads quickly about the actual quality of a movie. Making this strategy to tie it to well-known events as a negative on your movie since it's all about its rewatchability. This also translates to declining interest in future installments, which is why the Bayfos died off in the first place. I guess Phil Manto doesn't understand the shifting of audience interest. And it's this method of utilizing the pre-existing value held by events and locations that Michael Bay uses in his movies again and again. He takes us to real NASA locations and launch sites. He grants us access to real military bases with real gear and personnel. He brings in real globally respected icons like Buzz Aldrin. This isn't something exclusive to Michael Bay. In fact, this has been done for decades. Director John Ford filmed actual combat on the island of Midway during the actual battle in World War II, leading him to later use the footage in his movie, The Battle of Midway. The pursuit of expensive cameos, locations, and shots for your film won't lead to a better film. Instead, it will just offer a cool fun fact like with the one I just mentioned. Here's one for Dark of the Moon. This car is a multi-million, one-of-a-kind car that they borrowed for a movie. All that effort to get it for shooting and it's something that flies over the heads of everyone who isn't familiar with luxurious cars. 
Personally, I would rather spend the money on cleaning up the flaws in the writing. But that isn't what we should be focusing on. According to Filmento, that is. Overall, he repeatedly infuses his dumb fictional robot movie with the veracity and significance of all this real life stuff to make it feel bigger than what it on its own could ever be. A story about alien robots being conflicted about using another planet as slave labor in order to rebuild their home planet has the potential to be a great story. Dismissing the potential of the premise due to finding it a dumb fictional robot movie is just being short-sighted. It's quite apparent how film perfection isn't accurate. Instead, it's a title to signify his series of positive videos. But what's the point of Filmento's video when it fails to offer fixes to the problems holding the film from perfection, per se? All he offers is the cheap tactics that got people into theaters, yet this reliance on such tactics are why Michael Bay films declined. They couldn't complete another trilogy due to the simple fact that audiences have grown wise to such tactics making Filmento's good-natured efforts to actually leading other filmmakers to failure instead. We were sworn to secrecy by our commander-in-chief. Oh damn, Buzz. Clearly this must be a big deal then. And that's something for us to consider as well. If you're making a movie about a fictional conspiracy, consider if that conspiracy would carry a bigger impact if it was built on the veracity of something real that everybody knows. If you're making a fictional scene take place in a random location, consider if that scene would play stronger in a real specific recognizable location that carries built-in meaning for your audience. You can't get every place in person Michael Bay can, and you probably shouldn't, but if Michael Bay can make a billion dollars off the back of something that happened half a century ago, maybe it's worth a try. Personally, I wouldn't suggest anyone to make shallow efforts to attach real-world events and locations to the movie as a way to guarantee success. If you want to tie into real-world events because it strengthens the actual value of the story, then go right ahead, as the work will shine through to your audience. The audience always appreciates meaningful effort over you just name-dropping it appreciating it to the point they'll keep talking about the movie for decades after its release. There's a reason why they re-release a 30th anniversary of the original 1986 movie, but not a 10th anniversary edition of the Dark of the Moon movie, despite the latter having more real-world references. Now that's the appreciation I'm talking about. You purposely screwed with your audio to the detriment of people's ears in order to drop hints of your sponsor. I don't have a negative stigma between an official Hollywood production to a YouTube video as both have the potential to be good and bad forms of entertainment. The biggest no-no is screwing with the audio, which is what you did for the sake of building up an ad. Hearing these faulty audio issues over and over again in order to make this video wasn't fun, and it makes your video less rewatchable. Which explains why you deliver a video every week regardless of quality because you're not confident your viewer base will stay subscribed. Sorry, that was a bit personal, but this is the unsung rule in filmmaking that a supposed film-centered YouTuber doesn't know about. The second way Michael Bay increases this movie's epicness is by repeatedly adding in an extra layer of material that gives the audience a unique experience that they can get nowhere else. As an example, as we're trying to locate the energy spike in the Chernobyl sequence, we suddenly come across a brand new type of Decepticon in form of this giant robot worm. And what you'll notice about this giant robot worm is that the reason it exists isn't because some writer wrote it in to be an integral part of the story. No, the only reason it exists is so that after being gone for pretty much the whole movie, it then ultimately reappears in the Chicago finale section to give us this. That's what we call lazy writing that tries to justify a later set piece. Yeah, so the sequence of our heroes being stuck in a collapsing high-rise as a giant robot worm tries to tear it down is basically Michael Bay's way of earning your 3D IMAX blockbuster ticket price. Big set pieces increase the value of the movie, and the price of it making no sense for the story isn't gonna hurt the movie at all. Except the set piece won't remain exclusive forever as other installments prior and later will devalue the movie and its set pieces as well as every other action movie in existence. You are literally putting your chips on set pieces that retain value based on the state of the competition. Do we have to do a history lesson on the rise and fall of the disaster movie genre? It's not like you can have great writing justify specific set pieces in your movie, but that would be ridiculous apparently.
Because what you see here, for one, honestly looks really incredible, but also gives you something that you can get in no other movie, only in Michael Bay's Transformers Dark of the Moon. And the four other Michael Bay Transformers movies, with only one of them having better writing. As another example, look at the arrival moment a bit before, where basically our military hero Lennox needs to get his team into Chicago by way of wingsuits. And again, does this happen because a rider made it an essential part of the story? Does it happen because it's been organically built up throughout the movie? Well, so Michael Bay watched 60 Minutes one night. He saw Julian and I flying around mountains in Norway. He called Spielberg and was like, I gotta have wingsuits in Transformers 3. So yes, again, the reason the wingsuit sequence happens is because Michael Bay was watching TV and then just suddenly came up with another extra layer of coolness to add to his movie. And very successfully so. Not only do the wingsuiting shots look astounding when enhanced with CGI, but as before, it also offers an experience that the audience can get nowhere else else. If you want to see people actually glide past skyscrapers in a visually battle-torn city, the only way to do that is with Michael Bay's Transformers Dark of the Moon. And when you offer the audience something exclusive they've never seen before, suddenly the cost of $15 doesn't really seem that much. Yes, until a different movie offers the same appeal with better writing. You're literally banking your movie's relevance on appeal of your set pieces, which can easily be offset by your competition. These are strategies that are 10 years outdated, and eventually even Transformers fans won't look back on these movies. If I want great writing, I can read the comics. If I want great action, I can watch the TV shows. And if I want dog shit, then I have the 2015's Robots in Disguise television series. We are also getting more live action movies with a rebooted timeline on the way. So that just adds more salt to the wounds. Still want to stand by this advice, Filmento? I'm not gonna go through every example, but suffice to say that Michael Bay does this more efficiently than almost anybody else. I'm gonna put a big X to doubt on that. Whether it's a tilted high-rise in this movie, whether it's a giant magnet in another movie, he always puts in the effort to create something distinctly unique. I like how Fermento said that Michael Bay doesn't care and only wants to offer the three Bs, but then says he puts in the effort to make impressive set pieces. Kinda contradictory. That entire portion of the building is on a rotating platform, by the way. And he worked to get it built along tight deadlines so he can put it into the movie rather than just CGI everything. Do your research, Filmento. I would reserve any statement of lack of effort with the fourth and fifth installment, since those movies have no notable set pieces. So much so that this movie might have actually began the whole blue sky beam epidemic in the form that we saw. That's not something to be proud of, honestly. He might piss on your face with soaring characters, but when it comes to delivering an exclusive cinematic experience, Michael Bay treats you like a queen, like on a level that very few are able to reach. When a director is pissing in your face, then it's no surprise when they start leaving, which they did, proving that these strategies aren't working and Filmento shouldn't be suggesting that these are good strategies to follow. The game plan fails to keep audiences coming back as the poor writing is too much. But Filmento won't suggest to fix those problems. It's not like there's any action franchise that has improved with multiple installments, or has continued through multiple decades even. The danger with this, however, appears when you don't care. If Michael Bay wants to add in a wingsuit scene, he'll just do it. We're gonna have to wingsuit in. It's the only way to get close. Regardless of whether it's actually even necessary. Sir, seals are here. Uh, it's a good day, boys. What do you got? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay, baby! Y'all come with us! Now that's more dialogue contradiction, but the actual attempt to get more soldiers into the city via different routes in order to save the world isn't necessarily a problem. It would be stupid that there were other groups of soldiers attempting to back up the current group inside the city. Fermento keeps making these half points when it comes to noticing the writing mistakes. When it's his job to do that, you would think he'll be able to get the whole mistake. Not just half. If he wants to add in a sequence of a robot worm taking down a giant building with our heroes inside, he'll just do it. Think we could use that rocket to shoot down a pillar? Higher! Clear line of sight! Regardless of whether that sequence even fulfills the very purpose it exists for. The building is going over! Hang on! Take cover! It's not a flaw that they failed to fire the rocket at the main pillar, but the fact that they chose a destroyed building to fire from. 
These are trained soldiers. They can fire a rocket from any angle, I would assume, as long as they have a clear line of sight and remain hidden so no one can attack them or block the shot. Here's another mistake. The miraculous disappearance of the Autobots from the plot so the giant worm can freely attack them for the set piece. This isn't hard, Filmento. Make the effort. If he wants to add in a random, non-consequential highway chase scene that literally reuses shots from his older movies, he'll just do it because he genuinely doesn't care beyond that. If it hasn't been apparent that Filmento doesn't do any research, then this is it. This specific scene was reused from a different movie due to being unable to capture the planned footage of the stunt as the filming was halted due to an injury of a stunt double. Stunt double Gabriela Cedillo had a cable snap and swing right into her head, leaving her partly paralyzed. They also did the shooting despite officially being told to scrap the stunt the day before, making the resulting injury more of a problem. Cedillo was able to have Paramount pay her medical bills and sue them for close to $18 million. Thank Filmento for not doing a quick Google search. Instead, you just assumed Bay, not anyone else, were being cheap and lazy. Good job, buddy. And so what you want to do is take this additional layer mentality, but then also actually care. Even if you think your movie is fully written, sit down and come up with all kinds of whatever cool extra elements to lift that movie into an experience that can be found nowhere else. And after that, pick the best ones and actually go back to rewrite the movie to make those extra elements an integral part of it that it cannot function without. Because if, for example, you're making a $200 million blockbuster and still can't give your audience something distinctly special that they can get nowhere else, do you actually deserve to be in the position of making it at all? A filmmaker can offer more than just big budget set pieces to attract an audience and to give the audience something special. Boiling down your project because people like Filmento sees too much value in set pieces is the reason why writing for big studio movies are declining. Times have changed since Dark of the Moon. Audiences are more wary of buying movie tickets due to many factors, including bad experiences with poorly written films. The same strategies were utilized in Age of Extinction and The Last Night, but it didn't work. If that isn't evidence to lessen your focus on set pieces and instead focus on the lighting, then maybe the success of the MCU will. Those two movies, Infinity War and Endgame, relied heavily on the lighting and establishment of a larger universe that spanned for nearly a decade and were rewarded for such effort. But I guess if you want to take Filmento's advice on a dated strategy that couldn't hold a franchise past five movies, go right ahead. I'm sure the general public won't drop you like the Bayverse or the Snyderverse. Or that dark universe that Universal tried to do with the monsters. Or Star Wars, as they will never release a movie ever again. The third and for today final way Michael Bay achieves commercial epicness is by consistently pushing his characters and situations to such extremes that they inevitably lead to extreme results. Extreme situations lead to extreme results. Like an extremely bad box office is the result of pushing your audience with an extremely long runtime and bad writing. I've kind of touched on this in a negative sense before by saying that pretty much everything Michael Bay does is like an exaggerated ADHD version of the real world. People in genuine danger are portrayed as goofy comic reliefs. Hey! I'm Wang. Deep Wang. It's going down, son. People in respected position of power are suddenly turned into easily controllable mental patients to give and distract us from the exposition. <laughs> I hate how these movies are too energized to sit still and are prevented from actually having the time to talk through these ideals and motivations behind their actions. Which would help characterize the Transformers in the, you know, Transformers movie. Overall, in Michael Bay movies, the relationship between what's being said and the way it's being said is often so incredibly skewed that it becomes just sheer absurdity. May I finish my Shuhua milk? I don't care about your exotic milk. I care about respect. In comparison, that scene is quite tame to the rest. Honestly, I don't find it absurd as I actually experience confrontations like this at my job. 
well, previous employment. But what this movie shows is that there's also a very useful side to this extreme mentality, which on the character end you can for example see with Sentinel Prime. Essentially, Sentinel Prime is an Autobot war hero and a mentor to Optimus who becomes a high value target in the plot after being resurrected because he's the only one who can use the portal device. And then, after being portrayed as the ultimate hero for a full half of the movie... For the sake of our planet's survival, a deal had to be made with Megatron. Right, so without any real build up or lead up or hints or even really any sense in the timing. What do you mean there aren't any hints about it? Sentinel Prime gave up the Matrix of Leadership in Africa because he knew he doesn't deserve it. The two of them were in Africa as well, and the movie establishes that the Decepticon leaders are chilling out there. His initial awakening was him attacking Optimus Prime as well. Someone Sentinel should recognize immediately since Sentinel is, I don't know, his mentor. People don't naturally resort to violence when they wake up from a long sleep. Also, he couldn't betray in private because the government confiscated his pillows, forcing him to violently attack the base. The sudden public destruction of the Autobot main base will also spark fear for the humans. So when the Decepticons demand the Autobots are to be exiled, it will more likely force the humans to comply rather than defy the Decepticons. How, in God's name, are you failing at criticism for a movie well known to be badly written? How is that possible, Filmento? All of a sudden, Sentinel just reveals to have flip sides and executes one of the most prominent Autobots in the franchise. Like, you can't go more extreme with your character pivot than this. It's not extreme. Stop using big words for the sake of big words. They just establish Ironhide's toughness and his ability to kill off Decepticons. It makes sense that Sentinel would take the cheap shot to take out a dangerous foe. I'll admit that Ironhide didn't get any substantial character focus, but the threat he poses was clearly established. Sentinel killing off Ironhide was also the perfect way to indicate to the audience that he is now a bad guy, presenting the clear message to the audience that he's a villain, and there's no uncertainty about it. This is tame compared to the last movie. But in a weird way, this out of nowhere betrayal is also the best thing that happens in the whole movie, because it essentially turns the plot on its head. Suddenly, the movie is no longer about evil Decepticons trying to take over the Earth just because they're evil Decepticons. It's now about the actually significant central moral question of which comes first, your home or the home of someone else that you now live in. The first installment was about Decepticons rampaging through Earth to get an all-powerful artifact that will restore their home planet and to later conquer the universe. Second one was about harvesting our sun and using the power to restore the Decepticon army and in turn their dying race. In this movie they invade Earth and attempt to transport their planet to Earth so they can use human slave labor to rebuild Cybertron. The Decepticons have always been about restoring their home world and in an extension the continuation of their dying race. How can Filmento forget the plots of the previous films but still feel emboldened to give advice about this film of the franchise? That seems a bit backwards. For Cybertron, what war destroyed we can rebuild, but only if we join with the Decepticons. No, it's not the only way. This is our home. Sentinel isn't evil. He's not a Decepticon. He's not a bad guy who does bad things for two hours and then gets defeated because that's how it works. Sentinel Prime wants to subjugate the entire human race into slavery. That is straight up evil. We just happen to have time to flesh out his character, rather than having a one note villain this time, so Filmento is technically right about Sentinel not being the Fallen. Both Autobots and Decepticons have strong ties to their home planet of Cybertron, but are morally against abusing nature and destroying alien worlds to restore Cybertron, while Decepticons aren't. Other stories explore the lines between the two factions being blurred, with the constant key difference being that Decepticons don't regret such actions. Sentinel Prime showed no regret in the killing of Ironhide, the death of hundreds of humans, and nearly killing Optimus. Sentinel's last words were him begging for Optimus to understand his actions, never to apologize for them. Sentinel is a Decepticon, and not donning the logo on himself doesn't make him less one. 
He's just a guy who's willing to go the distance for what he believes in. And you would be wise to remember the difference. Meaning that when we ultimately get to the end fight where Sentinel takes on all the Autobots including Optimus to defend the portals, it can actually feel massive. Because not only are we fighting our mentor, we also understand who we're fighting enough to know that he's gonna go all the way, that we're playing for real. I guess you could say the past villains weren't playing for real. The Fallen wasn't really into the whole destroying the sun thing. Fermento has a habit of mixing different qualities of a movie together to the point he uses massive to describe a competently written villain which is confusing. If Sentinel was willing to execute a prominent Autobot on behalf of what he believes in, then there's really nothing he won't do for that belief here. It's not just what we see, it's the extremity we know to be driving what we see. Please, for the love of Christ, use a thesaurus and stop using words normally used to describe size when describing the quality of the lighting. How hard is it to see having clearly established goals and desires for your villain is a step up from the previous villain? At least Filmento didn't misinterpret an obvious, I'm evil, I killed someone to cement that, stop thinking otherwise. Thank goodness for that, at least. And the same extremity applies for most of the central characters. The human villain has been pushed so far off the edge that he ultimately proactively ends up choosing alien invaders over his own kind. Considering how involved he was in making the invasion happen, thus leading to the death of hundreds in Chicago, I don't think he can afford risking the Autobots winning. Under the Decepticons, he could have a position running human matters for them, while the Decepticon's defeat will ensure he will be arrested and executed for his crimes against humanity. I don't think he's doing it because he believes in the cause, as he said. You want this to happen? I want to survive. I want 40 more years. You think I asked for this? I inherited a client. Yeah, and when Cybertron's here and we're all their slaves, I guess they'll still need a human leader. Don't jinx me. Sam is so messed up about potentially not being good enough for his new girlfriend that conflict follows him everywhere he goes, and ultimately also leads him to perform insane deadly actions just to fix what he broke. I think it's more helping to save the world twice and having nothing to show for it. Need I remind everyone he is currently living at his girlfriend's apartment and works as a mail runner. His girlfriend doesn't care, but Sam is still troubled by his shortcomings, as he has always been working toward a normal life with a family that can rely upon him to support them. Sam extends these qualities to his willingness to be thrust into multiple dangerous adventures to save the world, seeking to see it to the end because he cares about the Autobots and the human race that is at stake. Sam makes the mistake to invest into the current adventure for honor and admiration, which pushes his girlfriend away to the point she becomes the villain's prisoner. He then refocuses and commits to saving his girlfriend no matter what obstacles lay in his way. Sam is a man aware that he isn't the richest, toughest, or manliest person and actively works to rectify such traits, and keeps his friends and loved ones safe. I wish to establish this because most people commonly only remember Sam for yelling all the time, including Fomento. Overall, leading to the situation side now, the entire hour-long finale section is like a masterclass at what I'm getting at. The Decepticons have taken over Chicago and made it impossible for even the army to get in, in a way that we've pretty much already lost. And yet, Sam, along with a small pack of ex-soldiers, still sets out on one last Hail Mary try anyway. No, that's not correct. The moment they see the fighter jets get destroyed, the ex-soldiers are aware of the danger and decide to not venture further. Yelling protagonist Sam Witwicky is the only one who pushes forward despite the guarantee he will die and fail. He doesn't force others to keep going, and honestly, if the Decepticon recon ship didn't interrupt their argument, then I'm sure Sam will accept that fate on the slim possibility he is able to reach his girlfriend. I'm fine with being the only one who considers Sam as a great but flawed protagonist. And I won't deny that the lack of the same character development for the Transformers in a Transformers movie is apparent and frustrating. The difference is that I will make sure to actually build up my argument and respect the possibility of no one being convinced. A type of thorough explanation that is absent in a Filmental video. I'm not here to say the finale itself is good or bad. I'm not here to say it's better or worse than anything else. But I am here to say that this Michael Bay Dark of the Moon finale is the type that a billion dollars worth of audiences, most likely including the likes of Chris Nolan, do find worth 50 bucks. Yeah, and it's the reason why this winning formula led to a long, happy film franchise. 
which ended after two more installments. Filmento is an ideal example of quantity over quality. The format of delivering a video every week is not sustainable for offering a proper critique and informed opinion about the topics discussed. Well, in a non-live stream form, I mean. After completing this response video and seeing others tackle Filmento's other videos, I've come to the conclusion that Filmento has potential to be great, but is stuck in the quantity over quality method of doing things that has plagued many content creators before. They fail to see themselves as entertainers that can produce content on par with the best of Hollywood, which translates to why Filmento suggests cramming big set pieces and lazy real life tie-ins to your project. After all, he cramps a lot of real life tie-ins like memes and music from others far more popular. There are other aspects to attract an audience that can be used by anyone from well thought out commentary, having a personality, and connecting with others on projects to help grow your following. Filmento also fails to exercise a true understanding of what he is talking about, as I've had to point out many mistakes in his points about the film industry and the film's plot. Though rushing to fill deadlines cuts into his research time and his wife, Filmento is light on a surface level at best. I'm deeply into Transformers so I can understand not everyone knowing what a transformation cog is or why Megatron becomes an Autobot. All my arguments and counters, as a result, were purposely limited to the films themselves, with some Google searches on the reasons behind the reused shots. It also translates to Filmento's video being jumbled and confused, as deadlines also seem to bite into any chance of re-edits. Another layer to the problem is the tendency to force an argument, like how Fermento tried stretching out set pieces as a perfect tool for filmmaking. It seems Fermento comes up with the idea, uses what he vaguely remembers about the movie, and then proceeds to pump out a video that is either strictly positive or negative. Fermento's focus on providing positive videos on films, especially ones that can't produce it, starts to degrade actual good advice that can be offered. Fermento is right about Sentinel Prime being a tier better than previous villains in the franchise, but he muddies the waters by stating the wrong aspects. Sentinel Prime being an actual character doesn't make the movie more massive. Instead, it makes the characters have stronger relationships and gives the giant robots something to do other than shoot each other. That's the major problem with Michael Bay's Transformers, filled with a lot of explosions and little time for the Transformers. Humans overtook the movie so much that it's common to find Transformers fans cheering for new shows and movies having no humans in the plot, which was made worse as humans tend to exhibit most of Bay's humor. Dark of the Moon was marketed as the last one, and it's the sweet spot at the time that can't be replicated again. The combination of Bay and Transformers can't work anymore as 4 and 5 are the two personalities at their breaking point. The Last Knight had an awful box office. It still made its money back, but it was significantly lower than the rest, which led to the gamble of a lower budget Bumblebee solo film that draws more toward the success of better fan received shows, video games, and comics. Bumblebee paid off, and now we are permanently sticking to a soft reboot with a new timeline, leading to the live action movies to finally act like the rest of the entertainment under the Transformers banner. In short, most of the positives discussed in the Filmentos video don't work even with the franchise it worked for, as it's since abandoned such tactics. The live action movies have taken a different direction. Hopefully, Filmento does the same. For the better.